CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to Global Business Europe, live from CGTN in London. I'm Juliet Mann. I'm Paul Barber. Our top stories. South Africa suspends the rollout of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine over doubts about its effectiveness against a variant strain. Are vaccine passports the key to opening up global travel? We hear from Denmark, where they're being launched this month. Tesla buys into Bitcoin in a big way, sending the cryptocurrency's value soaring. Protesters in Myanmar demand the release of political leaders as the head of the military says he's formed a government. South Africa has suspended its planned rollout of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. It comes after trial data showed the jab offered limited protection from the variant, which is dominant in the country. Distribution of the vaccine was scheduled to begin next week. Well, our correspondent, Angelo Coppola, joins us now live from Johannesburg. So, Angelo, tell us a bit more about this study and how it will affect the rollout program. Well, the bottom line is the results came in at a poorly 22%. So that's 22% effectiveness for mild and moderate cases of the, uh, of the virus. And that just wasn't good enough. The lead uh, investigator, uh, Professor Shabir uh, Mahdi, actually went on to say he was quite disappointed by it because the test was small, it, the, it was statistically um, irrelevant, and also it wasn't meant to test for um, the variant in the country, which is the 1351 uh, vaccine, the B1351. And bottom line is that they are going to be doing something about it, but not right now. So what happened, in fact, is that the, um, the Minister of Health, Zwille Nkise, did come forward and say that they're going to be using the vaccine anyway, but they're going to be using it in conjunction with an implementation study. So that's why it's been suspended and will be delayed somewhat. So for now, what we have is that uh, implementation is going to happen, but we're not sure in terms of dates at okay. the moment. Paul? So, Angelo, what does this mean for the other vaccines in the government's immunization program? Well, Paul, there are a couple in the, uh, uh, vaccines that they are looking at. Pfizer, for example, Moderna. Um, they are in discussion with Sinopharm and with Sputnik, the, the Russian um, vaccine. And they started talking to these people, uh, these groupings seriously when they got the results. And they got those results, those poor results last week. So they have started discussions with those uh, um, entities to see if they can get vaccines in time. But what was quite encouraging was that there was a Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine trial that ran at the same time as the AstraZeneca one. And those results are very promising. In fact, the CEO of the South African um, Medical Research Council said that they or they're very happy with the outcomes, and they've already had advanced stages of discussion with, uh, with Johnson & Johnson in terms of rollout. Some people are speculating that they might see some of that uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine come into the country as early as next week. We haven't got confirmation on that just yet, but Johnson & Johnson was the shining light of that uh, announcement that was made last night. That's what we have for now, Paul. Angelo Coppola in Johannesburg. Many thanks. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has defended the AstraZeneca vaccine, claiming the jab is effective against serious illness and death. Nicole Johnston reports. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been hailed as a great British success story. So the British government and the vaccine's developers have been pushing back against any debate or controversy that questions the vaccine's efficacy. However, the variant first identified in South Africa does appear to be a real problem. The British government says the Oxford vaccine will prevent severe illness and death in cases of the strain that first appeared in South Africa, as well as protect the healthcare system, even if it doesn't protect against mild illness, meaning you can still get sick with COVID-19. And down the track, that means vaccines will have to be adapted to target any new variations of the virus. Oxford says it hopes to have a new vaccine dealing with the South African spike sequence by the end of the year. We think that all the vaccines that we're using, both the vaccines that we're currently using, 
are effective in, as I say, in, in stopping uh, serious disease and, and death. We also think, in particular in the case of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, that there's uh, good evidence that it is uh, stopping transmission as well. The UK is still trying to hunt down the variant first identified in South Africa. It's carrying out surge testing in different cities across the country to catch community transmission before the strain becomes dominant here. Now, this strain is also more transmissible. As for the variant of the virus that was first identified here in the UK, the British government says the Oxford jab works well. And an Oxford study has found that its efficacy is at 75%. Nicole Johnston, CGTN, London. So have confidence in the AstraZeneca vaccine. That's the message from the UK government, despite concerns over its effectiveness against a variant common in South Africa. Early findings from a small study suggest it offers minimal protection against mild disease, and that's prompted the World Health Organization to schedule its own review of the vaccine. Ryan Thompson's in Frankfurt and, and joins me now. Hello there, Ryan. Tell us more about the concerns and the impact that they could have on the vaccine effort in Europe. Hi, Julia. Well, of course, this concern comes from that South African study, but it was quite a small study and it still has not been peer reviewed. Here in Europe, uh, mainland leaders are echoing a lot of the same words from London, that there's nothing to worry about with this AstraZeneca Oxford jab. Uh, we saw the French health minister, Olivier Véron, actually get the vaccine earlier today, and he spoke to reporters after reaffirming his support and saying that he has confidence that it will be able to confront these new strains that we're seeing from different corners of the world. I, I think it's safe to say here that after a long and complicated row with AstraZeneca, many European countries are short in short supply of vaccines and they're looking forward to these extra deliveries we saw them begin over the weekend and countries were opening their doors giving them out as soon as they can by the millions doses of the oxford astrazeneca vaccine have arrived across europe in bulgaria the first delivery came in the middle of the night and quickly it was transferred to the health ministry's temperature-controlled warehouse. In Italy, soldiers have been tasked with guarding and distributing the jabs. Nearly 250,000 doses landed at a military airport outside Rome this weekend, a fraction of what was originally promised. E tanto, e poco. It does not matter if it's a lot or if it's little. The important thing is that the plan goes ahead without losing a single minute with respect to the arrival and delivery of the doses. The AstraZeneca vaccine is one of the cheapest on the market. And unlike its competitors, it doesn't require complicated storage and delivery plans. Many EU nations are facing short supplies of the already approved vaccines, including France, which was quick to put the newest delivery to work. Doses arrived Friday night, and by the next day, vaccinations had begun. France has joined Sweden, Germany, and a long list of other EU nations that are giving the vaccine to healthcare workers only, instead of the elderly. Some scientists disagree with the trial data conclusions behind this decision and say there are still too many questions. The data situation for the elderly is not sufficient. It's important to note here that the problem is insufficient data and not poor data. The European Union is expecting 40 million doses of the vaccine to arrive before April, a number that's half of what was originally promised by the pharmaceutical giant, but does include an additional 9 million doses following talks between both sides. And the World Health Organization is taking a closer look at the vaccine and that data in these coming days. We're actually just awaiting a press conference from their headquarters in Geneva where we're expecting them to give a little bit more information. We know that they have a special guest in attendance, a number of scientists from South Africa, as well as uh, a key minister who's on South Africa's COVID-19 committee. Ryan Thompson in Frankfurt, thanks for the update. Well, Shabir Madi is the executive director of the BITS Vaccines and Infectious Diseases Analytics Research Unit, which led that trial in South Africa. And he joins us now from Johannesburg. And thanks for coming on the program. Um, how much of a setback do, do you think these results are? 
So good evening. Uh, so it is a setback in so far as I think we need to um, moderate our expectations of COVID-19 vaccines, especially in relation to the type of variant that's been circulating in South Africa, which has pretty much spread to at least 30 other countries, as well as the variant that has emerged in Brazil. So these vaccines won't necessarily protect against mild and moderate infection due to these variants, but that doesn't dismiss the importance of these vaccines in doing what vaccines really should be all about immediately. And that is about saving lives and protecting against severe disease. I think I still remain fairly optimistic that these vaccines would have a major role to play, including the AstraZeneca vaccine in terms of protecting people against severe disease. So we need to have a more targeted approach in terms of who we want to vaccinate in the immediate future, especially in the context of a limited supply of vaccine. You talk about that targeted uh, approach, but um, look, if the virus keeps mutating in the same way that flu does, if that's what you're expecting, I mean, does that mean that there'll need to be tweaks to the vaccine each time? There probably will be. And I think as countries start rolling out vaccines, and especially when there's a sluggish rollout of the vaccine, you're probably going to start seeing the emergence of mutations uh, which are resistant to the vaccine-induced uh, immunity. Uh, the reason why South Africa is facing what it's facing is because of the vaccine adapting to what was a high force of infection during the course of the first wave. So, yes, we're very likely going to be experiencing where, the, where vaccines will need to be updated, and we probably will need to rethink eventually who exactly is it that we're wanting to target for vaccination. And I think thinking that we're going to get to some sort of herd immunity, so-called herd immunity threshold, with vaccines, I think uh, that unfortunately is pretty much uh, fading from the scene pretty rapidly with evolution of these sort of mutations. So if herd immunity is sort of rapidly diminishing and we're moving away from that, is there a, um, a single best way to prevent mutations from appearing? Well, the only way would be if there was a global initiative to be able to vaccinate as many people as possible over the shortest period of time to be able to pretty much get close to eradicating the circulating of the, the circulation of the virus, which unfortunately is not going to happen uh, anytime soon. So I think COVID-19 is here to stay with us uh, for decades to come. Uh, but it's all about trying to mitigate the consequences of infection, especially the severe consequences and a death that can culminate from infection. It sounds like what you're saying is that the key is working together as a global community to tackle this crisis. Uh, absolutely. And I think any country or government that thinks that they can only protect their own individuals uh, and remain immune to the importation of variants that become resistant to the vaccines that they're using, unfortunately, I think there will be a shock coming very soon. When we hear the WHO having concerns and having um, more, more conferences to discuss the details uh, around it, you know, what, what would you like, like to say to, to these organizations and to, to countries to, to move forward as opposed to keep on reflecting backwards? Oh, without question, we need to move forward. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, the focus needs to be, or the immediate focus needs to be around trying to protect those individuals that are most vulnerable to developing severe disease and dying from COVID-19. And those are people over the age of 65, people with comorbidities. They are the ones that need to be prioritized when it comes to vaccines, especially in a context such as South Africa, where we know now that as an example, the AstraZeneca vaccine doesn't work against mild and moderate infection. And for many of the other vaccines, they would probably experience a knock, a knock in terms of the efficacy against the variant, including the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine and every other vaccine. As we've observed, even for the Novavax vaccine, when it was evaluated in South Africa, where the efficacy was only 60 percent against the variant compared to 90 percent in the United Kingdom. So this is a conversation that keeps on going. Moshabe Amadi, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks for coming on the programme. You're watching CGTN coming up on the program. Is Denmark about to change its working week with a new pilot for reduced hours? Covering the world from four continents. A new horizon. Teams in Beijing, Washington, D.C., Nairobi, and London. Who connect, interact, and inquire to bring you the stories that matter to all. The Link, only on CGTN. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda Podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. Don't forget you can sign up to our daily newsletter, 
will bring you all the top business headlines straight to your inbox. So sign up for free at this address. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back. Schools, museums and shops in Austria have reopened as the country begins to scale back its third lockdown. Anyone wanting to enter a shop or a museum will have to wear a medical grade face mask and school pupils will be tested for coronavirus every two days. The government says it will assess the situation in two weeks time with a possible reopening of restaurants and cafes on the cards. And in Romania, more than two million children returned to the classroom on Monday. Schools have reopened after a three-month lockdown, although some students will continue to study online. For pupils in classrooms, face masks and social distancing are mandatory. But kindergarten-age children will be exempt from the face mask rule. Denmark says it's developing a digital vaccine passport. It will act as a record for anyone wishing to travel both internally and to countries that require proof of inoculation. Some other countries have held off on the idea, including the UK. Well, Thomas Bostrup from the Confederation of Danish Industry says the app will contain three pieces of key information. Well, uh, we imagine that it would be an app that uh, every Dane are carrying uh, on our mobile phones and uh, and the app will, will basically contain three uh, information, three kinds of information. One, whether we, uh, uh, whether you've had the, uh, the vaccination or not. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, when the last time you were tested uh, and of course the result of that test. And thirdly, whether you've actually had the coronavirus at some time and, and thereby have some kind of immunity. In the shorter and longer term, how do you think that COVID passports could help a recovery from the damage caused by the pandemic? And how could they change daily life for people in Denmark? Uh, that it could uh, increase the mobility in the Danish society until basically uh, all of us uh, uh, have been uh, uh, had our vaccination. Um, and hopefully then, secondly, it will also be a tool for us to travel. Uh, we would imagine that other countries would uh, would start having the same kind of uh, development of, of of a passport or an app, and uh, and thereby something that you use in the airport. And what kind of work do you think does have to happen for an internationally functional passport system to work? I think probably on the EU level, uh, firstly, uh, our our leaders of states and governments will will have to agree that that this is something that uh, that is needed and uh, also to, to create some kind of international standard for this. Uh, of course, one could wait for that, uh, but, but it doesn't seem like there is, there, there's a lot of uh, interest on EU level uh, among the member states. The Commission is quite eager to develop this, but among the member states. Uh, so basically, I mean, some countries just have to, 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 to go along with it and try to develop it and get some experiences and, and show how it can how it can create, how it can uh, increase mobility uh, on a national level and, and thereby hopefully also increase uh, mobility on, a, on an international level by, by traveling. And how confident are you about the technology? There are some concerns, aren't there, about uh, it being vulnerable to fraud and counterfeiting. Actually making digital, in the digital work world, will, will actually ensure that, uh, that, that uh, there's not too much fraud about it. Let's take a quick look at financial markets and the story is the expected US stimulus package which could lift global demand despite COVID continuing to take its toll on the global economy. Now, oil prices have surged to pre-pandemic levels. The benchmark Brink crude, well, you know, that returned to $60 a barrel um, for the first time since February last year. 
The Tokyo Stock Exchange Nikkei hit 30-year highs. Wall Street opened in the green. The S&P 500, Dow Jones Industrial Average and Nasdaq all hitting new record highs. And the oil story lifted European indices ever so gently. We can have a, a look there. The FTSE up nearly 1%. Um, but what we mainly saw was strong gains for miners and for the oil giants. So let's take a quick look at BP and the fellow super major Shell. Shell up around 1.5% there. But look, BP up 4%. So the message from the markets is risk on. Um, having a quick look at currencies, now Bitcoin is the story of the day, having jumped to a record high after carmaker Tesla disclosed a $1.5 billion investment in the digital currency. Let's go to John Terrett in New York to, to find out more about this. Great to see you. <laughs> Great to see you there, John. What has Elon Musk been up to now? Well, 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 Juliet and Paul, let me tell you, I was in a restaurant on Friday night celebrating my daughter's birthday, and the maitre d' said to me as we were leaving, you know, I know you work for CGTN Global Business, what do you think of Dogecoin? And I said, well, I don't really think, I know it's a cryptocurrency, but that's really about all. He said, I think Mr. Musk is about to put lots of money into it. I said, well, OK. And so I spent the weekend worrying that I should be doing more about this story than I have done. And then I wake up this morning in New York to find that he's put $1.5 billion into Bitcoin. And, you know, it, this raises questions here in New York about the tweets that Elon Musk has been putting out over the course of the last week or so. He added the word Bitcoin to his bio on Twitter and on Clubhouse, which is quite a controversial app and website. He was talking up Dogecoin at one point as well. So people wonder whether he shouldn't perhaps have been letting the regulators here know that he was buying at this level. Apparently he has done that now in a filing to the SEC this morning. But the other thing is that now you will be able to buy a Tesla, assuming you can afford one. I can't, by the way, but you can buy a Tesla with Bitcoin if you wish to. And as a result of all this, Bitcoin is currently up 16 percent, well above $44,000 per Bitcoin. And Dogecoin it was up 30 percent this morning. It's now up 21 percent when I checked just now. So finally, we open another week on Wall Street with a battle set between the novices and the professionals because Janet Yellen, who is the new Treasury Secretary for the Biden administration, has said several times that she'd be quite happy to curtail these cryptocurrencies, that she has linked them to terrorism. She calls them mostly used for illicit funding. But of course, Young people, just like Elon Musk, just simply do not see it that way. And, of course, this comes a week or so after the GameStop saga. That appears to be fizzling out, by the way. Now GameStop's down 4% at $61. AMC, the movie house chain, down 11% at the moment. But one thing I will leave you with, don't ever underestimate Elon Musk. He has an awful lot of followers who will go wherever he takes them. Juliet and Paul. Don't underestimate Elon Musk. And happy birthday, John, to your daughter. Thanks very much, John Terry, at the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> yes, indeed. China's market regulators say they have met representatives from U.S. electric car maker Tesla to discuss customer complaints. Problems have included battery fires, unexpected acceleration, and software update failures. The company is currently seeking to recall over 36,000 vehicles which were imported into China. New anti-monopoly rules for China's tech sector were introduced on Sunday. It comes as regulators try to crack down on anti-competitive behavior. The new law is aimed at stopping e-commerce giants like Alibaba and JD.com JD from abusing their dominant market positions. It will also prevent platforms forcing vendors into exclusive agreements. UK chip microchip designer Dialog Semiconductor has agreed to a $6 billion takeover by Japanese firm Renesis Electronics. Shares in the company, which supplies Apple, were already up 25% since the start of the year. The surge continued on Monday, at one point up a further 18%. Hyundai has denied reports that it's in talks with Apple on developing a self-driving electric car. The, self, the South Korean firm said it needed to clarify rumors about a joint project with U.S. tech giant and Hyundai affiliate Kia Motors. Shares in Hyundai fell 6% on Monday, wiping $3 billion off the company's value and more than $5 billion off Kia. Online retailer Boohoo has swooped again, buying up UK clothing stalwarts Dorothy Perkins, Wallace and Burton for just $34 million. But like its Debenhams buyout in January, the deal covers the brands, the websites and inventories and not the shops. Around 214 retail outlets are likely to close with the loss of 2,500 jobs.
China's foreign minister says his country and the European Union are competing forces, but that cooperation between the two is stronger. Wang Yi has been holding talks with the EU's top dip diplomat, Josep Borrell. Tony Waterman is in Brussels now with more. So, Tony, lots discussed at this meeting. What were the main talking points? Yeah, this was a very uh, wide-ranging discussion on the international front. They discussed U.S. relations, the recent coup in Myanmar, and also the Iran nuclear deal. But it was bilateral relations which took center stage. And as you mentioned there, Wang Yi saying that the two sides are competing forces, but that cooperation is greater. And in that vein, they discussed what progress has been made on the EU-China investment deal. This was a deal which was struck at the very tail end of last year, and it would give each side greater access to the other's market. They also discussed uh, the importance of working together to ta tackle climate change. This comes as we gear up for COP26 uh, at the end of this year. And they also discussed the ongoing pandemic with China calling for deeper uh, cooperation around vaccines. And certainly the immunization program in Europe has been uh, rather lackluster to a, a lot of people. So this is an area where they see future cooperation also around making sure that those jabs get to developing nations, which uh, thus far they have not received received any sort of bulk uh, shipment of these vaccines. They also discussed some more sensitive issues, including the situation in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, with uh, Wang Yi emphasizing that China opposes uh, other countries interfering in their internal matters. So quite a lot of things that were up for discussion earlier today. And in Brussels, many thanks indeed. The economic slowdown doesn't appear to have damaged London's inflated housing market. Now, a rather unusual property has come up for sale. Measuring just 1.6 metres across, London's thinnest house is priced at $1.3 million. So to see what a million dollars buys you in London, spoiler alert, not very much, go to <laughs> europe.cgtn.com. And remember, CGTN is available on smart TV apps such as Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV. You can also watch us on YouTube, Dailymotion and of course at CGTN.com and on the CGTN app. You're watching CGTN. Still to come, we look at how China can strengthen economic ties with European countries ahead of a summit this month. Patient after patient after patient, they take a long time to get better, they're the sickest patients we've ever seen. It's a race against time, because we can all see uh, the threat that uh, our NHS faces, the pressure it's under. We're dealing with something we knew very little about. Europe's first two epicenters in February have received their first dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Another day, another grim milestone for the UK in its fight against COVID-19. 100,000 people have now lost their lives after contracting the virus. Agenda with me, Stephen Cole. We look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. We can try out the wild and crazy idea. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we're trying to save the world. Oh, no. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope.
Hi there, welcome back to Global Business Europe with Juliet Mann and Paul Barber. The headlines again. South Africa has suspended the rollout of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine over doubts about its effectiveness against a variant strain. Denmark will launch a vaccine passport system this month, hoping to get its aviation industry back off the ground. And Tesla has made a $1.5 billion investment in Bitcoin and says it will accept the crypto as payment for its cars. China's ambassador to the United States says American technology companies are welcome to invest in the Chinese market, but that recent restrictions must be overcome. Curbs on tech collaboration were one of the main disputes between the U.S. and China under the Trump administration. But speaking to CNN, Sui Tianquei said the row had become over-politicized. To be more accurate, all these companies, what they want is a major market share in China. I don't think that their goal is to share technology with China. They just want to make money on the Chinese market. Of course, they could come, and we are open to all American companies. But there are existing and even mounting restrictions imposed by the United States government against all this flow of technology, free flow of technology and information. This has been the case for so many years, but especially for the last few years. I think technological progress should benefit everybody, the, the entire global community, and everybody in any society. But this issue has been so much politicized, this is very unfortunate. Well, for more on relations between Beijing and Washington, we're joined by our correspondent, Jim Spellman, live in Bethesda, Maryland. Good to see you there, Jim. Are there signs of a change of tone under the Biden administration? Yeah, I mean, clearly we're already seeing a less confrontational tone, but I think the language coming out of the White House clearly reflects the reality, which is that this is a very strained relationship between the U.S. and China. President Biden says he will build, though, on his personal relationship with Chinese President Xi Jinping, a relationship that began when both men were vice presidents of their respective countries, and Biden says he is open to a phone call. Listen. Well, we haven't had occasion to, to talk to one another yet. There's no reason not to call him. I probably spent more time with Xi Jinping, I'm told, than any world leader has because I, I had 24, 25 hours of private meetings with him when I was vice president, traveled 17,000 miles with him. The question is, I've said to him all along, that uh, we need not have a, uh, uh, a conflict, but there's going to be an extreme competition. And uh, I'm not going to do it the way that he knows this, because he's been sending signals as well, that I'm not going to do it the way Trump did. We're going to focus on international rules of the road. And over the weekend, the U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken spoke with China's top dip diplomat, Yang Jiexie. Yang saying that China wants uh, to have, quote, no confrontation, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation, and that the U.S. should stay out of China's internal Affairs. This is a line that we've heard drawn many times from Beijing, but there's no indication that the Biden administration is going to stop talking about any of these issues. In fact, after that phone call, the State Department released a statement saying that the U.S. will continue to quote, push, quote, democratic values in Xinjiang, Tibet and Hong Kong and will aim to maintain stability in the Taiwan Strait. Earlier in the week, though, the State Department did reaffirm the U.S. commitment to the one China policy. So I think the question here is what is the Biden administration prepared to do beyond just talking about these issues and how hard and how fast will they push it? Paul? Jim, let's switch to domestic affairs. Donald Trump's second impeachment trial due to start in the Senate. Do we have any idea yet about what line of defense Trump's legal team will be pursuing? Yes, yeah, so the Democrats are going to argue that there was direct incitement from President Trump that led to the violence in the Capitol. They plan on using video, some of the many social media clips that were posted that day, to argue their case. We expect to hear from rioters expressly saying that President Trump's words led them to take the actions that they took. So what we can expect from Trump's defense team is, one, to argument that there was no direct incitement, that he was just generally speaking about the election. 
and that that is his First Amendment right, former President Trump's First Amendment right. We also expect the defense team to argue that it is unconstitutional to have an impeachment trial of a former president, that this is a procedure designed only for current sitting presidents. That will give many Republicans the political out that they need to avoid taking a stand on the actual issue and just talk about this procedural issue. We also expect Trump's defense team to basically make a counter argument to say that many of the Democrats in the Congress themselves have supported Black Lives Matter protests, which sometimes became violent, and they plan to show video to back up those claims. That's a clear indication that this is a political exercise more than it is a legal exercise. We do not expect President Trump himself to testify, though he was invited to do so. Look, the bottom line here, it will be extremely difficult for Democrats to get a conviction. They'll need 17 uh, Republicans in the Senate to go along with them. Because of that reality, they aim to have this be a somewhat short affair, perhaps only two weeks long, but then get back to Joe Biden's agenda. Paul? All right, Jim, thanks so much. Jim Spellman reporting from just outside D.C. The head of Myanmar's military has addressed the nation, saying that he's chosen a cabinet days after the army overthrew the democratically elected government. Meanwhile, police are threatening to use live ammunition on protesters, demanding democracy is restored and demanding the release of elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi, along with other political leaders being held under house arrest. Dave Grunebaum has more from Kuala Lumpur. In his speech, Senior Gentleman Ong Long said the Election Commission used COVID-19 as an excuse and did not allow fair campaigning. He talked about election irregularities, and he said they will hold new elections and hand power to the winner. He says he has formed a government of suitable ministers. But the bottom line is there's little doubt that the public is not going to have their opinions changed, because this is more or less what we heard coming from the military in statements a week ago. And the majority of the people in Myanmar did not believe it then, and the majority of the people in Myanmar are not going to believe it now. They believe that a government was voted into office back in November in a free and fair election in November, and they were supposed to take seat their seats last week, and they believe that the military threw out that government last week, and they want the people they voted back into office. That's the mood with the general public. That's not about the change. And at the end, I don't know if they're going to try really clamp down on the curfew too hard tonight, since word is really just trickling out. But tomorrow, what we've got to keep an eye on is do a lot of people in Mandalay, do they ignore the rules? I mean, the rules, in addition to the 8 p.m. curfew, the rules say no protesting and they cannot gather outside in groups of more than five. And so are people going to still come out onto the streets in mass numbers and demonstrate against this military government? And if they do that in Mandalay, in those seven townships that are, uh, according to the AP report, under martial law, how does the police respond? Are there going to be mass arrests? Is there going to be something more violent than that? That's something we've got to see on. And how does the rest of the country respond to all this? Do we see the demonstrations in Yangon grow? Do we see it spread to even more cities across the country and into more villages? Tomorrow is a real critical day to see what happens across the country. Indian authorities say they are searching for at least 177 people following Sunday's glacier collapse in the Himalayas. 18 people are known to have died after a vast chunk of ice broke away and crashed into a river, causing water to burst through two hydroelectric dams. Well, many of the dead and missing are thought to be workers at the plants. Nearby villages have been flooded and the Indian army has been drafted in to help. Andres El Ruz has claimed victory in the first round of Ecuador's presidential election. If exit polls from Sunday's vote are proved right, he'll head into an April runoff. But it's not yet clear who he will face, with two other candidates currently neck and neck. Former economist Aruz heads a coalition of left-wing parties, and he says he'll end years of austerity policies. Israel's Prime Minister has pleaded not guilty to corruption charges as his trial resumed in Jerusalem. Benjamin Netanyahu vehemently denied charges of bribery and fraud. A group of anti-Netanyahu protesters gathered outside the court, chanting slogans and holding banners. He'd urged his own supporters not to gather in large groups because of coronavirus. Southwestern France has been hit by heavy flooding following days of torrential rain. Several other regions, including eastern Paris, are also on flood alert ahead of worsening weather forecasts for later this week. The heaviest flooding was in Saint, where the River Charmont hit near record levels. Hundreds have been evacuated as local authorities strengthened flood defences. 
plunging temperatures have dusted much of Europe in snow, with forecasters expecting one of the most prolonged cold spends spells in years. While many people across the continent are enjoying the weather, in some areas it's caused serious disruption. Germany's national rail operator has suspended connections across the Dutch border. A summit aimed at building closer economic ties between China and Central and Eastern European nations will get underway this week. It's part of the Belt and Road Initiative that brings countries together through investment projects. Alyosa Milankovic reports. The pandemic pushed the planned summit from last year to this February. Instead of meeting in person in Beijing, the leaders of 17 countries in Central and Eastern Europe will meet their Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, online. The main topic of this year's gathering will be collaboration in fighting the pandemic. Despite the ongoing crisis, some analysts say the future of the China CEC format is bright. They cite the recently signed EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, as well as China's help in the ongoing fight against the pandemic. Serbia is one of the top-tier examples in the China CEC framework. Just last year, trade between the two countries reached almost 3.9 billion US dollars, while the total Chinese direct investments into Serbia reached 1.12 billion dollars. Chinese investment also created 3,500 new jobs in Serbia, according to the country's economy minister. We see ourselves as a link between China and Europe, and we think that there are a lot of cooperation possibilities. We'd also like to help China to establish good relations and create better business deals with Europe as much as possible. Launched in 2012, the China CEC group of countries aims to advance trade and investment between members. But in the nine years since, it's been criticized for lack of tangible progress. Now it's hoped the trade deal with the EU will not only benefit the 12 members who are already a part of the EU bloc, but also have a positive impact on the other five who are tied together in this larger partnership. Which can um, finally represent uh, a uh, new uh, dimension that will go, give a new dimension to this cooperation among these Central European countries with China because for the first time European Union wo won't object towards this cooperation. Alyosha Milenkovic, CGTN, Belgrade. Spain may be taking its first steps towards shortening the standard working week. The country is about to trial a reduction in working hours. Employees won't have their wages cut and the government is contributing 50 million euros to the project. Founder of the four-day week campaign, Maria Alvarez, joins us now from Madrid. Thanks ever so much for coming on the program, Maria. And do you think this is a COVID response or can you see benefits outweighing costs more generally? Yeah, absolutely. Um, myself in my own company, apart from uh, running this campaign, I own two companies that have implemented the four-day week. And what we're seeing is an opportunity to improve our companies, increase productivity, and kind of create a shared revolution with the workers where we can look towards like a better future for everybody. Now, it's a pilot scheme that's going to be run in Spain for now, anyway. I mean, to what extent do you see a more permanent shift in attitudes towards this work-life balance that, that you've been doing in your own businesses? Well, I, I really think this, uh, this thing with the reduction of the working hours have been coming uh, for a long time, really. Um, we have examples everywhere, but the, the most like damning example right now is how it is absolutely impossible to keep the balance between work and private life, and especially uh, caring for children and for uh, the elderly anymore. So this is a tension and a struggle that's been ongoing for a very long time, and this pandemic has done nothing but to exacerbate it. And I think the pressure is there everywhere. You can see it. In the, in the studies that are run every year into workers' attitude and in how women are uh, massively dropping from the workplace uh, and for, from the work market right now, that we do need a fundamental change. And I do think that it, this is the change that's going to be coming, a reduction of the working hours. Now, some countries condone more of that workaholic culture, if you like. I, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of Japan. Uh, where can you see this concept working, and where might it be a harder sell? 
Hmm. Uh, we actually, in Spain, we do work uh, very long hours. Like we're one of the European countries where uh, worked hours are higher. Um, but I think, in fact, like the, the reduction of working hours has been linked through history with an increase in productivity. So even those countries that are more inclined to like put output before life balance or any other uh, issue. Uh, are going to be um, forward-looking to this through this uh, four-day week. And in fact, uh, Microsoft has trialed the four-day week in Japan. And the um, uh, business association, the, the largest business association in Japan, is pushing for a four-day week in this. This concept, though, of having shorter working hours, particularly in times of economic crisis, it, it isn't new. So tell us about where and when it's worked in the past. You mentioned Microsoft there, but you know, let's let's look a bit further back. Well, in fact, the the, the most striking example of where this has worked in the past is Google. Google has been uh, running a 20% uh, policy in their company since 2005, where every worker in the company can uh, put aside 20% of their working hours to work on a project that benefits Google somehow, but not directly. So many, many, many uh, Google workers dedicate some of their time, 20% of their time, which would amount to a day per week, to things that are not related to their job. And it works, and well, we can see the results. You mentioned women and the impact that, that COVID has had particularly on them. So to talk us through that and how a shorter working week might particularly help them. So this pandemic, what it's put on the table is that there is a, a, a crisis, an underlying crisis, a big elephant in the room uh, when it comes to uh, uh, juggling work and care. And we know that women do the majority of care around the world. And so uh, what we're seeing is that during this pandemic, women have dropped from the job market more often than men, and that mothers particularly are getting the worst part of it. And this is a disaster even for our economies everywhere, because we know that the economic growth that we were expecting that we could look forward to in the 21st century was linked in a, a great uh, deal to women getting uh, in the job market. Um, so this uh, four-day uh, movement, in fact, has been led everywhere by women. Like Jacinda Ardern, the, the Prime Minister uh, from New Zealand, and the First Minister from um, Finland, and the First Minister of Scotland. Those are all strong women leaders that are pushing for this change. And here in Spain is also a movement that is led by women right now. Just like you, well, Maria Alvarez, a pleasure talking to you, founder of the Four Day Week campaign. Thank you. You're watching CGTN still to come. Recognizing business excellence, we'll find out who the top performers were at the Italy China Awards. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. agreement is signed. But what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU? For trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people. Make sense of Brexit with CGTN.
Welcome back to Global Business. Italian companies have been recognized for their outstanding business connections in China at the 15th Italy-China Awards. Italy's ambassador to China says relations between the two countries are stronger than ever despite the pandemic. Hermione Kitson reports from Milan. Neos may not be an airline you've heard of, but it's certainly taking off in China, and it played a key role during the pandemic. Dozen and dozen of Italian passengers were sitting, waiting for somebody taking them back home. And this is the, what we did, so a sort of a rescue flight package, which we agreed with our foreign ministers. Neos was founded in 2002 and started flying to China in 2016. After a pause in passenger flights due to lockdown, the airline now operates the only flight between the two countries, from Milan to Nanjing. So we are having tests in the airport which are on top of tests which are already performed by the passengers, on top of quarantine requirement in China. The result is outstanding. For a second year, NAOS is a winner in the China Awards, recognizing Italian companies excelling in the Chinese market. To award these companies of excellence in various fields recognizes the depth of ties between the two countries and presents them as examples to follow in the future. Another company receiving top honors this year, ASK Industries, which designs and manufactures car audio and antenna systems. It was founded in Emilia-Romagna in 1965 and started business in China 17 years ago. What I like the most about receiving the award is that there's also recognition for our team in China. The company now has 3,000 workers worldwide. More than half are based in the Chinese headquarters of Ningbo. You cannot do automotive business and be relevant without being in China. We always try to deal since day one with the local government to understand what we can bring to the territory. China is Italy's largest trading partner in Asia and the foundation says business between the two countries is key to Italy's pandemic recovery, especially for smaller companies worst affected by the economic downturn. China's ambassador to Italy says despite the challenges of COVID-19, the two countries are committed to working together, a sentiment shared by Italy. Italia nel 2000... In 2020, Italy managed to export 13 billion euros of goods to China, an amount identical to 2019 despite lockdown. These are important figures that give a sense of the intensity of the relationship. And these markets will be crucial as Italy works to move ahead in its recovery with a new national government. Hermione Kitson, CGTN, Milan. Well, France's health minister has been given his first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. As he received the jab on television, Olivier Varane said that it had been shown to protect against nearly all COVID variants. France's vaccine rollout has so far lagged behind several of its European neighbours. Well, the pandemic has badly impacted France's economy, including the country's varied cultural and creative industries. Ross Cullen reports from Paris. France's culture minister says the government is planning to reopen cultural venues as quickly as possible, but only when there is a noticeable decline in the number of coronavirus cases here in France. Speaking to the media on Monday, Roselyne Bachelot said she wasn't going to put a precise date on it, saying that deadlines can be questioned at any time by what's an extremely elusive and unstable health situation. Now, also speaking to the press, on Monday, the directors of the Paris Opera, the company which runs Paris's famous opera houses, including the legendary Palais Garnier Opera House you can see uh, behind me. Uh, they were saying that last year they had to cancel 145 shows, leading to reimbursement costs uh, totaling around $30 million to customers who had bought tickets. They say that this year they're going to be running a budget deficit of around $25 million but they have had some success in online shows, streaming some of their events, and they did receive $49 million from the government in financial support uh, last year. But the directors of the Paris Opera saying that overall their activities have been very severely disrupted by the effects of the pandemic. Of course our activity has been greatly impacted, and also even so far this year we've had to cancel several shows and a ballet but the rehearsals of new productions are still going ahead under strict sanitary conditions. Everyone has to be tested, wear a mask and respect the basic coronavirus guidelines. 
Average daily cases here in France are hovering around 20,000 at the moment. But last year, the government set a target of trying to average around 5,000 new infections a day, which would allow it to reopen the hospitality and culture sectors. The closure of France's culture industry doesn't just mean that some theatres and cinemas are shut, but also world-famous venues such as the Louvre Museum, the Musée d'Orsay Arts Gallery, and historic monuments such as the Arc de Triomphe and the Eiffel Tower are closed to visitors. This means that venues such as this have been shut now for more than three months since they were forced to close again when France brought in its second national lockdown in the autumn. Ross Cullen, CGTN, Paris. Time now for a bit of musical healing. Students and teachers at a secondary school in northern Germany have recorded a song in Chinese to send their good wishes to the people of Wuhan. Zhang Nini reports. Turning the negative parts of the year to the tune of positivity and hope, choir members and teachers sent a message of empathy with their song after the pandemic. Even though we are in the pandemic and we have this situation, we still manage to get our lives together and stay strong together. And I think that's the main message of the song. Maximilian was one of the first members of the choir at Bird Gymnasium Secondary School, one of the few schools in Germany which has Chinese language as an optional course. Chinese teacher Zhang Yugang has organized a regular singing session on Saturdays since 2013 as a way to improve students' Chinese pronunciations. The choir is now made up of 35 students and expanding. Tenth year student Josephine Martin comes from a family of three elder siblings, all speaking Chinese. I've been influenced by Chinese culture for my entire life. And um, that's also why I went to the Chinese choir when I was just a little girl. I tagged along with my brother and sister and just uh, sang the songs for fun. While some members have a connection with China, 11th grader Juro Zurowiski, whose father is working as a professor at Beijing Institute of Technology, also sees a future. At the speed of the city, everything, it's like uh, magical. Yeah, so I would really like to return so it motivates me at school or learning Chinese, doing everything, yeah. The students have been to several summer camps in Beijing, Shanghai, Chengdu and Wuhan. Their good memories, in particular of Wuhan, have motivated them to record several songs since the start of the pandemic. We have this memory of this beautiful city and with these beautiful people and every, everything was so negatively portrayed. But this is why we did the video to send hope and um, to cheer people up and to show the, our sympathy. With COVID restrictions still largely in place in Germany, choir members have to practice apart. They hope their singing will send an uplifting message. And they look forward to the day when people meet again. Zhang Yinyi, CGTN, London. And our main stories again. South Africa has suspended the rollout of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine over doubts about its effectiveness against a variant strain. Denmark will launch a vaccine passport system this month, hoping to get its aviation industry back off the ground. And Tesla has made a $1.5 billion investment in Bitcoin and says it will accept the crypto as payment for its cars. That's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all of our stories at europe.cgtn.com and please follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're available to watch on smart TV apps such as Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV. You can also find us on YouTube and Daily Motion, And of course, cgtn.com and the CGTN app. Up next on CGTN Africa Live, but we'll see you again tomorrow. Same time, same place from all of the team in London. Goodbye.